Ladies and gentlemen, the president-elect of the United States, Donald John Trump. The inauguration of Donald Trump occurred on January 20th, 2017 in Washington, D.C., on the west front of the United States Capitol building. Trump is currently the 45th president of the United States, and his inauguration was the 58th presidential inauguration to take place. This inauguration was considered highly controversial for a number of reasons, from Trump having no political experience to his often racially charged campaign tactics and rhetoric. During the presidential race, Trump ran as a Republican and chose the slogan, Make America Great Again. People tend to think of the inauguration days as a time of nationwide pride and celebration, but this was not exactly the case at Trump's inauguration. Donald J. Trump is now President of the United States. The Women's March was created as a response to Trump being elected, and protesters began gathering for it on January 20th. It was the largest single-day protest in U.S. history. The march in Washington drew around 750,000 people who gathered to advocate for legislation that addressed women's rights, immigration reform, LGBTQ rights, racial and religious equality, and workers' rights. The frames we will focus on are morality and human interest. Through our research, the Tribune tended to stick to the facts, while the New York Times utilized facts but also had numerous op-ed pieces about the inauguration. We felt it was important to talk about morality and human interest because of the way the two frames interconnect with each other. Issues of morality were a big theme in the New York Times article from this day because of how polarizing the election process was. There was a mass variety of different voices nationwide of people who identified as Democrats, Republicans, and Independents who felt fear for their own lives or the lives of their loved ones with Trump taking office. Do you think he's smart? No. Why not? He treats people badly, and that's why I don't think he's smart. A lot of nicknames for people like Crooked Hillary, Rocket Man. Do you have a nickname for him? Um, Poop Face. The articles even went on to include prominent government officials, such as Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio, voicing his disdain for the newly elected president which left readers feeling supported or angry, depending on their own beliefs. The Code of Human Interest framed Tribune articles in two main ways. The first was focused on the way in which American citizens were going to be impacted or were impacting Trump's inauguration. We, the citizens of America, are now joined in a great national effort to rebuild our country and restore its promise for all of our people. The second was focused on the way in which the nation was going to be affected by the inauguration and the new presidency. Together, we will determine the course of America and the world for many, many years to come. The difference between these two frames connects to how the frames were supposed to affect the individual and the public. The Tribune's focus was less from a morality, emotion-driven standpoint, and more from a factual standpoint. When talking about American citizens, it pulled direct quotes from supporters and protesters. The Tribune showed the supporters that were hopeful and limited the amount of quotes from protesters or weary citizens. Or the Tribune showed the opposers as the problem. And when America as a country was brought up, the articles talked about the future of the country, not the individuals. The sources we studied left us feeling as though we had a certain call to action, but what the call was differed between the Tribune and the New York Times. For the Tribune readers, I felt on a micro and macro level, readers need to unite together. The frames were intended to affect an individual's emotional and behavioral response to rally behind the country and put quarrels aside. Regardless of political party as Democrats, Republicans, or Independents, in order for our government to run effectively, Everyone needs to be able to set their differences aside and put America first. The New York Times' call to action took form in a slightly more direct way. A large chunk of the voices included were from those that were not supportive of Trump and felt that it was time for the people to voice their anger, their demands, and to hold the newly elected president responsible for hearing them out. 
The implications from the Times articles were heavily focused on the protesters and the demand that if they could not control who was president, they at least wanted to ensure they would not be silenced any longer. Both of these sources used the frames to agenda set for the future, but had different aims. The Tribune wanted to set the agenda in terms of focusing on what Trump will do as the 45th president of the United States. The New York Times wanted to set the agenda to allow people to watchdog and keep Trump and the government in check for the next four years.